So a lot of your previous work before incident uh, had a, a big focus on old archival film footage. And I wanted to ask mainly how is the shift from, I know you worked with other things before, but how was this uh, kind of drastic shift from that type of archival footage to a, a new type of archival footage? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's true. A lot of my footage has not only been archival footage, mm -hmm. but very old archival mm -hmm. footage. Um, and so a lot of what has been the point of the earlier stuff is that it shows material degradation, mm -hmm. um, which of course is a specific subsection of, of archival footage. Um, so in this shift to using a contemporary archive, um, I of course didn't feel like I was dealing with film. I didn't feel like it needed to be edited the way in which you would edit film. And so I was more at liberty to use some video devices like uh, well, the split screen and the quad screen and uh, the wipes and um, this kind of thing that I, would, I would, normally wouldn't use. So in, in a way I treated, um, the form reflected the type of media that I was using. Mm. And uh, there is of course this material difference between uh, the old footage and the new footage, but how did you approach, not in a, in a material sense, but in like uh, a more contextual sense, how do you feel like approaching footage that was very old with footage from our contemporary times that you were, that you were cutting right now? Well, I mean, my choice of older footage always has been a reflection and through the prism mm -hmm. of contemporary times. Of um, usually they're meant to show either how little things have mm -hmm. changed or, um, you, know, uh, you know, the difference between um, our society now and 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, um, you know, um, we're seeing uh, the systemic racism of mm -hmm. the um, police force in the United States, um, which is something I have um, referenced in earlier work uh, in Buried News from a few years ago, uh, where I used uh, race riots from 100 years ago. And I think eventually the, these two films will be shown together. Mm. Um, so uh, do you think there was um, a certain uh, difference in uh, approaching this new topic that is so inherently political in a contemporary sense with your already political work in, an, in another area? Or do you think it was a more um, uh, natural shift that would already be happening? Well, I mean, to me it felt natural because mm -hmm. um, uh, when I was presented with this archive, it, it, you know, it, you know, the, I saw the potential for the film there almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And I'm always inspired by an archive to make a new film. I'm, I'm seldom uh, picking through an archive to, to support a theory. Um, it's usually, it comes from the archive and my projects grow organically out of that. And that, that was the case here too. Uh, that said, um, you know, the, the issue of gun control obviously is at a crisis situation in the United States right now. There's, mm -hmm. um, there's probably a mass shooting that's happened today that I don't know about yet. I mean, it's, it's just preposterous. And, um, and, in some ways, um, well, in very explicit ways, this film uh, underscores the hypocrisy uh, of those who are allowed to carry guns and those who um, are allowed to p carry guns but um, are deemed by the police not that they shouldn't be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's this, um, so there's this real a big use of like angles and split screens, as you've mentioned before. Yeah, and we can we can piece apart uh, a narrative from all these different views and angles and aspects yeah. and in your with this use of split and zoom you mean I mean in your older work there's a big focus on um, the, the, the decay of it being old footage like in the Kasia, for example in, in the old archival footage it having a material physical space but there's an interesting thing it, even if it's connected to the narrative the the zoom ins and the split screens and the lower quality of how it is filmed, there's also an apparent uh, plasticity of the limits of digital, of the, the pixelization mm -hmm. and the weight enhances. Uh, what, what, are, what's, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I don't think of it as a materiality, mm -hmm. but I do think of it as self referential. Of course. Um, that a big part of this film is, um, of course, the law that I. Uh, 
you know, set up in the beginning as a contextualization that now all of this footage is uh, man- mandated that it be released to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't the case before. And so this is in ways a police force that is coming to grips with this new law. Um, there's a performative aspect of it that mm-hmm. they know they're on camera and mm-hmm. they know that anything that they say could be used to incriminate themselves or one of their colleagues. Um, and so there's this dance that happens about um, even acknowledging the truth of what what they saw mm-hmm. and, and, the, and how slippery the truth can be, mm-hmm. even when it's recorded. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, uh, there's several different types of cameras that were used in this. There's the, the establishing shot, which is mm-hmm. the POD or police observation device. Um, then we cut to the um, the closed circuit TV, the private security cameras, mm-hmm. um, which are the, the highest resolution that we have. And from there we go into the uh, dashboard cam and the body worn cam. And it's not until we get to the body worn cam that we have audio. So this difference between these silent mm-hmm. cameras that establish the scene and the context, mm-hmm. uh, and then we dip into the contemporaneous uh, footage, which you know gives us a story. Um, and then as soon as those cameras are turned off, the ones with the microphone were back out looking yeah. at a scene that we have no context or, or no grasp mm-hmm. of what's happening. Uh, so I think it uh, also underlies how little we can possibly know. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's really dependent on uh, what's captured at the time, and what's um, released. Um, and, you know, sort of absurdly, all these cameras are manually triggered, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't serve anyone's purpose mm-hmm. for the from the police officer, of course, they can't be expected if things get really uh, heated in the moment to say, oh, I have to turn my camera on. They have other concerns, right? And us as a public, um, we want to make sure that everything um, before it got heated, what were the circumstances? What was the buildup? Um, so these cameras should be on all the time. And, um, and in a way, this underscores that as well. Uh, yes, and just my last question for best of you. Um, of course, as you mentioned before in your work, uh, you use footage of old race riots, and there there has already been um, a more political approach. But um, how uh, how do you feel there is a difference in going from in this uh, other type of footage you use? From a lot of the footage has uh, an artistic or an aesthetic point in its inception. Yeah. where this new one in incident is incidental or utilitarian footage that has is filmed for a specific technical purpose. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I mean, in some cases, the stuff that's become artful, as you mm-hmm. say, uh, began as a, a course, utilitarian yeah. footage as well as actuality footage or mm-hmm. um, some sort of record of, uh, uh, of something that otherwise would seem um, I don't know if you'd call it artistic. It would just well, yeah, yeah. It's reportage, um, and uh, I guess it's the treatment of it, or, mm. or you know, in, or as our perspective changes. There's uh, incredible accidents that happen mm. uh, with an incident that I think are artful, though I'm not trying yeah, to aestheticize yeah. a murder. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, you know, this seagull is the uh, an accident, but it becomes the narrator. It brings mm-hmm. us into this. Uh, this story, and that was, of course, purely circumstantial. Yeah, of course, there are um, obvious, even if it's not planned, there are obvious narrative points that show themselves as you're seeing a story. It's something that actually happened. Yeah. Even the moments there's a, almost a siege going on <laughs> around the police. There's a, yeah. the moment where they have to talk and they can't talk freely to each other, and they know this, and they're trying to orchestrate. Yeah. Really good. So, yeah. Um, um, so I was going to ask you, uh, we already talked a little bit about it, about like the, the editing side and the, the multiple cameras you used that yeah. were at your, uh, that you used to make this film. And I was just uh, wondering how do you, because your a lot of your, your previous work, as we talked, is uh, old archive footage. So editing is more of um, a thing about mood or... Um, about a, a certain meaning on with um, 
with the evolving of the images of the old archival images and here you're telling a real story uh, how is this change of approach from working with such a abstract in a way uh, material to such a concrete it's kind of the same thing but I yeah i mean to... i just want to clarify that um not much of my work has been abstract for a long time now mm. i mean dawson city mm -hmm. frozen yeah, time was mm -hmm. a, a, you know incredible feat of journalism you know mm -hmm. um if i do say so myself yeah. so uh um you know i know that my reputation started with decasia and people often think of um this sort of pure abstraction is um, my known diploma or whatever, but I, I just want to draw people's attention that I've been making, you know, what you call straight documentary films since The Minor mm -hmm. Sims, which is 2011, you know, mm -hmm. so that's uh, 12 years now. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I'm always going to be considered like this weird abstract guy. You know? <laughs> uh, that said, you know, like I said, I, I, I try to edit. Um, in a way that is consistent with the material that I'm using. Mm -hmm. So um, with all that stuff that was derived on film, I would use uh, straight cuts. Usually I don't use dissolves a lot. Um, if I do slow something down, it's in the denominator of 24 frames a second. Mm -hmm. So that I'm either doubling a frame two times or I'm tripling it three times. I'm not mixing uh, weird frame rates or something like okay. that. You know, uh, I don't use a lot of split, split screen or zooms in or you know this kind of stuff I try to stay true to the integrity of the frame. Um, again, because this was pixels and it was lower resolution, it was video, I felt like um, I could treat it in a different way. So mm -hmm. um, that was a different approach. And again, um, this is a, uh, a story that um, took place a couple miles from where I grew up, a couple miles from where my mother and my sister still live. Uh, it's very much um, a part of my personal background, mm -hmm. um, this neighborhood. And so that's I would say the most marked difference uh, okay, with uh, with it, with my earlier work is that this is in some ways um, more autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. Um, I would like to also ask you about um, your stance in documentary filmmaking and truth uh, in our uh, in archive analog films. Decay plays plays a major a major role. Um, and do you see a, a crisis in documentary filmmaking and truth in the this new age of sound manipulation and a certain new uh, way of decay, perhaps uh, in terms of morality or in terms of authority, and how is that reflected in your movies in a way? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would add to that uh, AI. Mm -hmm. You know, this is mm -hmm. the great um, the elephant in the room right now. You know, um, and it's also you know when you talk about an AI image, it's really against the archive. You know, any any film shoot uh, is an archival act, right? Any time you record anything, what we're recording now, is there's a time code, there's a date stamp that makes it archival. The moment it, it happens, it doesn't need to sit in a vault and rot to mm -hmm. become archival, right? It's immediately archival because it has those numbers and it's titled and it can be called up again. Mm -hmm. uh, what AI is doing is it's stripping those numbers and it's taking little pieces and it's decontextualizing, deauthorizing de-copywriting mm -hmm. um, through atomization of images and um, uh, the potential, I don't, I don't know if we can imagine it yet, but just what we're seeing in the last, let alone the last five years, but the last five months is really breathtaking, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, um, I guess if I see a change, um, it's it's there, you know, it's it's more um, that, that when, when you talk about you know, political actors or human emulation, um, it can be it can become very difficult very soon to discern what is true and what mm -hmm. is not um, if it if, if it isn't already. Um, and um, I think you know, moving forward, we're going to need to see those numbers. We're mm -hmm. going to need to see that time code as part of uh, any sort of you know uh, evidence. You mm -hmm. know, if we don't see them, there's will be reason to doubt everything. Okay, yeah. Um, and one last question I, I'd like to also ask you, if you think this, um, that having this, um, this new movement and this new age beginning, do you think um, archive uh, movies, whether it be old ones or new ones, 
could in a way be a response and a, a counteraction by going to the past and bringing the past to the present or to the future and by contextualizing it could it be a, a sort of weapon against uh, this manipulation of uh, images we'll have to see because <laughs> i mean uh, obviously you can add a time code to anything mm -hmm. i added a time code to incident right mm -hmm. um it doesn't make it real um but uh, uh we're gonna have to be very clever Mm -hmm. about how we communicate to each other to say um, this actually happened mm -hmm. because uh, you know we're already in very um, on thin ice you mm -hmm. know the, um, in, in my country there's uh, an enormous amount of the population that wants mm -hmm. to deny that a presidential election took place yeah. you know if this is uh, an example of a leader of the free world um, what does it say for the rest mm -hmm. of the world you know um, this could happen on a regular basis where people say, oh, but that's not real, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't know if looking back to archival footage will always save us from that. Mm -hmm. um, I think our our task at hand is to discern um, what happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's kind of a scary time we're entering. Uh, possibly that one? Um, um, so, on that point of uh, a certain objective reality and people denying yeah. this object, the, uh, what the world considers objective reality, I would like to uh, go to your movie and uh, try to get a sense of if you think it's objective, oh. uh, if you think what's there, it's there. Well, because I imagine, for example, seeing that the police officer uh, got a very short sentence and yeah. got out really fast i could imagine uh those images being misconstrued and still seeing a lot that happen we still don't see enough to be able to bulletproof it and say this is exactly what right. happened yeah i mean um just to play devil's advocate um in the devil in this case being the officer who shot the 37 year old middle-aged mm. barber walking mm. back from work on a saturday night um You know, those are very rough streets and, um, and you know, um, you can't show weakness. So you have, you know, uh, with a different character, this could have turned out differently mm -hmm. in defense of the police. They do have to make split decision, uh, split second decisions. In this case, in this case, um, they created a situation mm -hmm. that where they had to make a split second decision. They, there was no reason this needed to escalate. I also think that the footage shows that um, that cop arrives with his hand uh, on his gun, as do two other officers, and uh, he's ready to go. You know, he as soon as he uh, the the victim goes between the car, he pursues him with mm -hmm. the gun, and it's not it's only then that you see um, Augustus reach for his gun. You mm -hmm. know, um, it's in in reaction to this guy. He knows he's going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Uh, What else can you do, you know? Um, uh, so I think it does show that. Um, I do think he got off easy. And there wasn't, um, Augustus didn't have a family um, that was in support of him. And, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't a law case brought by an aggrieved um, mm -hmm. family. You know, the, um, people didn't, he was a loner. You know, people didn't know him that well. So it was, uh, there weren't a lot of people lobbying on his behalf. Mm -hmm. um, And, and the police thought that the fact that he showed a gun and that he might have been reaching for it was enough of a gray area that they could run for cover. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that there's no question in my mind that it objectively shows that they created that situation. And Bill, how did you come across this uh, footage? So a friend of mine named Jamie Calvin um, is a journalist in Chicago, and he actually had... Uh, had filed a case against the Chicago Police Department um, uh, to sue for the dashboard cam of the Laquan McDonald case, the case that had happened in 2014. So it was really because of his efforts and another journalist that um, this law was passed whereby the Chicago Police Department had to release footage. Mm -hmm. So uh, through the, uh, in, with the Invisible in Institute, they uh, collaborated with forensic architecture firm in London and recreated, um, uh, digitally recreated what those, um, what, what had enacted, you know, reenacted 
those scenes um, using the existing footage and with that created six different videos that contextualize this incident in different ways. Um, when Jamie wrote about it, he referred to some of the footage um, in footnotes, um, that, which sent me to the archive. Mm -hmm. And by reviewing all the footage that was in the archive that had been uploaded by the Chicago Police Department, I started to understand this as a, a story that could be told in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really through Invisible Institute that I became aware of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.